just to do a quick intro, my name is Ian Donnelly. Uh, I've uh, been working in cybersecurity as a recruiter for the past six years. Um, so really looking forward to this event. I'm very passionate about this space. Um, we've got a, a really good panel lined, uh, lined up here. Um, and we're going to explore some core challenges that uh, we're seeing in, in the cybersecurity industry at the moment. It's such a hot topic uh, at the moment. There's a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, and uh, we have some good questions lined up for our panel. Uh, before we uh, kick things off, I just want, or before I uh, introduce the panel, I just wanted to uh, um, just mention or highlight a, a poll that we recently conducted within our leaders of tech community. Uh, we put a question to um, to the to our uh, uh, to our community: uh, How concerned are they about uh, cyber breaches impacting their organization's data? Uh, and over fifty percent came back that they're very concerned. Um, it's a huge number, uh, but probably not overly surprising with, uh, you know, a lot of um, the high profile breaches that have happened over the last year and with a kind of a largely dispersed workforce, um, you know, you can kind of expect that it, it increases the threat landscape uh, for all organizations and uh, I'm sure they're all looking at ways how to kind of, I suppose, improve their overall uh, security posture. Uh, so I'm sure you guys will all come away with really good insights um, from the panel. Uh, so I'll kick off and, and uh, just introduce our panel. Um, first of all, we have Daryl Flynn. Daryl is the Head of Information Security and Technology in Revolut. Daryl, if you want to jump in and uh, do a quick intro there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, I've been an information security professional for about 15 years. I uh, worked in a variety of industries from gambling, insurance, finance, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, just really passionate about the topic and glad to be involved in it. Cheers, Daryl. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Dara Mooney. Uh, Dara is the uh, principal security engineer in Yapstone. Uh, Daryl, do you want to, or Dara, I beg your pardon, do you want to jump in? And... Yeah, no problem. Um, hi, uh, yeah, I'm principal security engineer at Yapstone. Um, been working in IT security you know, 12 to 15 years. I don't like to think back that far, so I'm not sure the exact time. But before um, Yapstone, I was um, um, in charge of development of Norton, Anti Norton LifeLux Antivirus product, and before that, head of K uh, KBC, uh, head of KBC Ireland Security, and head of Threat Management and GameStop. Very good. Thanks uh, for that, Dara. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, Stefania. I'm hoping I'm going to pronounce her surname right. Lao Cielo, Lao Cielo. Um, and uh, Stefania is uh, the um, Information Security Risk and Compliance Manager in Interactive Brokers. Um, Stefania, if you want to jump in. Hi, thank you, Ian. Uh, yes, I'm uh, uh, the IT security risk manager in Interactive Brokers. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience in IT risk management, information security risk management, compliance, governance, IT audit. Uh, I have been working as an external auditor as well, as an internal auditor and in different uh, sector. Uh, in the last few years, I have been working in the financial sector, but also in many other industries and have been working in Ireland, but also um, uh, back in Italy, in my own country. Thanks, Stefania. Appreciate that. Um, good stuff. So I, I think we'll, we'll jump into the, into the questions here. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to highlight um, we have a, a little question and answer uh, tab down there in the bottom right of your screen. So any questions you, you might have, um, you know, just jot them in there and I'll do my best to, to cover them off before we wrap up. Um, so the first question um, is for um, both Dara and Daryl. Dara, if you want to answer first, um, cybersecurity has been uh, in, the, in the news quite a lot this year, uh, most notably the HSC breach, making the biggest of headlines. Uh, looking back, what lessons do you think we've learned from this attack and what steps can organizations take to kind of, I suppose, minimize uh, this from happening to them. Very good question. Oh, sorry, sorry, Dara. I wasn't too sure that he say Dara. Dara, Dara. Yeah, I beg your pardon. I think I said Dara, uh, but uh, yeah. Dara, don't mind. Dara, uh, Dara, if you want to go ahead, but don't mind. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, thank you, Dara. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, it's absolutely disgusting um, attack, and especially against a health service, and even more so during times of COVID. And um, but yeah, I think like one of the big takeaways is you've got to look at, you know, it's an old classic principle, but it's to do with backups 
um, you know, the quality of your backups, the regular uh, testing of your backups. Often we do this in isolation uh, as a business, but do you, you know, you fail over multiple pillars of your business at the same time. Yes, you can bring your data back up, but is it accurate data? Is it complete data? Is it the quality you need to operate? Um, so I think a lot of it rolls back to these um, simple um, kind of classic things that have been in security for as long as me and Dara have been, or don't want to remember we've been in security. But, um, and then look, cyber incident sessions with C-suite, with senior management, talking through the likes of, um, you know, ransomware attacks. Um, you know, if your quality of your data is poor or your backups aren't done, you may very well need to have the conversation about paying a ransom. So, um, yeah, look, I don't want to exhaust it for uh, Dara, but over to you. Cheers, Dara. Hey, cheers, Dara. I completely agree with that. It is a reprehensible event with the HSC. But my own kind of opinion of the last year, looking back, um, was there was more than one incident. Um, what kind of told me is that, you know, from a challenge perspective, what the industry needs to face is, is also to understand how we can be more reactive in terms of our climate. So with COVID, a lot of people moved to working from home models. Um, and there was attacks around that. Within certain companies that got breached, certain individuals were targeted. Going back to Daryl's point, paying attention to particular staff members, you know, it's quite vital to be able to sort of reduce your impact. Um, from an organisation on a technical point of view, because um, I've worked an awful lot on the technical side of the house, you know, my advice to organisations would be very, very simple. It would be to couple on to Daryl's point, is to test your um, your DR and, and, and business continuity practice uh, procedures to make sure you are able to, you know, get back to business and restore your data, but also to make sure that um, your technical um, controls are, are, are kept in good, in good health. And what I mean by that is not just testing out the likes of your security operations center, but also maintaining um, the least amount of technical debt that you have in your environment. And what I mean by technical debt is obsolete technologies, stuff that's not being looked after, meaning you know servers not being patched, whatever that may be. The more you keep a handle on that, the more you reduce your tax office. Very good, thanks for that, Derek. Uh, I'm actually interested as well um, to get a perspective from Stefani on that as well. Um, given a kind of a governance and IT audit, uh, is there any kind of, I suppose, uh, perspective that you'd have or uh, insights, um, Stefania, from from that from that point of view? Yeah, indeed. Uh, from a risk perspective, I suppose cyber risk is one of the top risks for many organisations, and especially if we talk about um, sector like financial sector, but also the healthcare system. Um, there have been many, many cases of cyber attacks, especially in the recent, in the recent last uh, five years, I would say. So uh, considering, considering this, uh, it means that, you know, if, if an organization is an appropriate risk register, the, their cyber risk will be a very high cyber risk, as Colm say there, um, as sorry, Dara say there, in terms of uh, likelihood of risk will increase. If we don't think about COVID-19, the number of uh, cyber attacks based on COVID-19 have increased significantly. Therefore, it's very important to make sure that there are sufficient controls in place to mitigate this risk from a technical side, but also from a human side. So making sure that human resources are trained and are fully aware of the criticality of the data they, they manage and they handle every single day. And of course, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, IT security teams have sufficient resources to be able to put uh, appropriate controls in place. And then another aspect is also, you know, key indicators, key risk indicators, have indicators in place and continue to monitor them because that uh, they, they can highlight potential vulnerabilities and, and, and can help to prevent uh, cyber attacks. That's great, Stefania, really good point. Uh, it actually kind of leads me nicely onto my next question. Um, Obviously, resources is key to, to every cybersecurity team. 
Um, and it's also been well documented that uh, there's been a, a kind of a skill shortage in the in the space in the sector. Um, th this is a question for um, both Daryl and Stefania. Um, can you think of kind of alternative ways that companies can kind of address this issue? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. yeah. I want to take it first. Yeah, Daryl. Yeah, uh, I don't mind. Um, yeah. Um, I'm like, look, resources are limited. Um, if you had an unlimited budget, uh, I'm sure you could find the right people because you could pay whatever you wanted to pay. But I think um, I'm a big believer in kind of like, it's nearly like, I don't know what you call it, like a graduate or a junior position in teams. Um, you know, starter roles they have to have been to, you know, college or university, but, you know, some self-learning, uh, some willingness to learn. So if you have some sort of stream internally, whether that's somebody coming across from maybe a different function, uh, you know, whether that be uh, something, you know, somewhat similar like a technology role or maybe an internal audit or a risk role, or maybe even a customer or a communication uh, role, um, all these skills can be used. So I think if you um, are willing to have these people shadow and if you will, a senior person leaves, a mid person moves up, and you've kind of got that um, pathway for people to grow. Uh, and I think if people are keen for the opportunity, you know, show some initiative and have done some self learning, I think that organic growth is maybe something that enough um, functions and uh, companies don't look for. We often, you know, they, they want the top professional, they want them to do everything. But they don't want to get multiple professionals because it gets quite expensive. Uh, and then, you know, I often think uh, professionals can get disillusioned and maybe that's why we see a high turnover in our industry as well. But I do believe like organic growth, people seeing the path, you know, they see that the person that is in the middle of the senior role, then they believe that kind of like junior uh, role can progress into something more. So it's um, I think we need a, a bit of patience. Uh, we need to articulate that to senior management to get that type of support. I've seen it done in uh, organizations I've worked in. You know, you might have like a junior person in GRC. Uh, you might have a junior person in, you know, whatever, uh, the network side of the house. And then, you know, you might interchange your spot roles over time. And then what you end up is after four or five years, that person's actually got a reasonably well-rounded skill set and they're probably a mid-level uh, employee. But, you know, if you're going to have a senior person step out and you have that massive gap, you could be looking at six months between replacing, hiring and getting up to speed. And I, I think there's very few organizations that could uh, tolerate that type of gap. Yeah, interesting. Um, and and a column, I, I suppose, I, I'm interested to kind of get your take on this as well. Uh, I know you're you're speaking to um, a, a lot of people that, that are struggling to 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 get jump into into roles in, in security as well. And just before I uh, just get your your um, take on this, Stefania, um, Colin, what are your thoughts? I think what, what we're saying so um, so the CyberQuest program that we're running at the moment uh, is a serious attempt uh, to try and attract unemployed people into the the cyberspace um, and I suppose what we're saying is uh, well at this stage we have about nearly 450 people through our hands you know since January of this year uh, and it's a real it's a real interest and mix of people um, in that some are, are curious about cybersecurity and others have made up their mind that they want to work within the field so so I suppose what we're saying is we're saying um, and I think this sort of starts to address the question of a skills shortage. One, we've got some, some money through IT at Cork, through the Department of Education. Um, so that's really helpful in terms of trying to attract, you know, people from a wider and deeper pool to have a look at the area. Um, but I think then what you need to do is you need to help them. You look at the specific learning pathways that are available for cyber skills and try and you know, facilitate that learning process where they get to the point where they're acquiring skills pretty quickly. Um, so we're, we're working with two particular platforms, two online educational platforms, as you'd expect. And what we're seeing is we're seeing, we're seeing progress. And I suppose the biggest uh, you know, determinant of what progress is that we're actually seeing people getting jobs. You know? yeah. So at this stage, we have about 70 people back to the employment 
there's, there's probably another four or five come back to fourth level education as distinct from third level education. So we think that's 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 a couple of points over the bar for sure, you know, uh, in, in terms of trying to make a contribution. Um, but I think the big point for me is, you know, we have been very narrow in terms of the types of people that we bring into the trade. Uh, and what we need is we need a much broader perspective in terms of who can come into this. Mm-hmm. And, and, and our, like our foundation program is just cyber awareness. But we've had, you know, coming off a cyber awareness program, we've had 33, 34 people who decided to progress into the skills programs. So once sometimes people get a, a taste for cyber, and it's not for everybody, but sometimes when they get a taste for it, they really you know, get a like and, and start to build up the skills level. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Great, and sorry, Stefania, um, what, what are you seeing in, in uh, do you have any kind of uh, insights in terms of how kind of companies can kind of address this? Yeah, so I believe, first of all, it's important to clarify the different roles that are available in cybersecurity and the skills required. Um, because I think there is uh, quite often the tendency to think that somebody working in cybersecurity has had to be very technical. Uh, this is true for certain roles, but it's not true for all the roles in cybersecurity. And that is, I think, something that has to be clear even uh, to organizations when they are looking for a new resource and, and, and make sure they are actually asking for the right requirement um, for that particular job role. Uh, another thing to be, take into consideration is probably think about programs to support uh, internal employees who would like to enter into the cybersecurity space, but they just don't get the opportunity. So try to support them, train them. And then another aspect is um, think, thinking about you know, uh, more junior resources, uh, and I, I do believe that it's important to have more junior resources within teams that can bring fresh ideas, that can think differently, and they can actually think about new vulnerabilities that maybe somebody who is in the organization for a long time will not be thinking just because it's just um, like, you know, involved in the, in the process for, for too long. So it's good to also have fresh ideas. And, and in order to attract also, um, you know, um, students, I think it's important to clarify to them what, what are the opportunities within cybersecurity, what can be the, the challenges as well. Uh, because I think sometimes um, probably uh, you know, students, they don't even have an idea, a clear idea what cybersecurity is. While there are more traditional job roles that they, they, they are more um, um, known, uh, and therefore, they might know they might go more for some fun, something that they know very well, rather than something that is a bit um, obscure, if I can say so. And they might not just go for the challenge, you know. And the last aspect I think that uh, can be taken into consideration is think about resources that might have uh, some uh, even technical skills, but they are not in the work market for a long time. Like women, for instance, that have been out of the market in maternity leave for a long time, and they would like to go back into the market and they might be interested in cybersecurity. And there can be programs there in place to support them to, to go uh, for, for, for that field. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for that, Stefania. Um, Dara, um, from your experience, what advice would you give to somebody that's probably looking to start or pivot their career um, in, in cybersecurity? Yeah, no problem. It's a very, very good question. The advice that I'd give somebody, um, the first thing I'd try to do is tag on to what Stefania said, is that not all roles in cybersecurity are necessarily tank. Um, there's many branches to which way you can fork out. There's a risky compliance side of things which may not be as technical as the, the hard on security operations or security engineering or you know, ethical hacking or red team. So there's, there's many different roles somebody can take in this career path. The advice I'd give to them was, would be to kind of look at you know, what's available to try and learn in your own time. Because cybersecurity in, in itself is, is something that you'll continuously learn. You'll never stop learning. The technology changes, the threats changes, um, the attack techniques change. And um, this is something that I've seen working in Northern Lifelock, where there was 
an awful lot of um, we're, we're working to try to um, combat a lot of antivirus ev evasion techniques. So what the advice I'd give to somebody that's um, trying to break into the in industry would be to first try to understand where they want to go within that industry. Do they want to be technical? Would they like to be working with the engineering or other tools, maybe, you know, pushing security tools in the cloud or actively trying to hack something? And once they understand that, if they can't, you know, try to do something that you can do right now, like a training course online, or if it was ethical hacking, maybe some what's known as CTF or capture the flags, flag uh, competitions. There's a good platform that you know I've used for the last few years, Hack the Box. Stuff like that would give you a hands-on kind of experience to what it is to hack something. And then there's multiple ways to be able to, you know, maybe download trials of tools, set them up in your own lab, um, and see if you can actually, you know, get them going or at least try to understand what they're trying to do. So without going into university courses or expensive training certification programs, which are great, which are fantastic, there's a lot of stuff you can learn in your own time as well. Very good. Um, really interesting as well, because it kind of leads me on to the next question. Um, and um, I, I, just from speaking with candidates myself and, and people that are kind of looking to either transition from maybe a more traditional kind of uh, support or you know system uh, administration role or even from a software development um, uh, line that you know they ask me constantly what kind of courses can I do and uh, I, I suppose anybody who wants to jump in and, and answer this as well uh, you know in particular areas what are the kind of the, the basis kind of uh, I suppose courses that you can kind of you can attain or um, what, what are the best ones to start up with uh, maybe, maybe Colm, if you want to jump in, because I know yeah, well, we're dealing with we, a lot of people in this. Yeah, we, we, before we kicked off CyberQuest, obviously we did a bit of research in terms of what was out there in the market. Um, and we landed on two. So, so CyberQuest is all obviously online. Um, you know, we do a lot of work in terms of tech talks and uh, seminars and all sorts of other stuff. But the main component is, is the online platforms. Um, we chose two. Um, InfoSec uh, IQ, which is a foundation program, um, and it has become a starting point for other people developing skills. And then InfoSec Skills, and InfoSec Skills is good because it, what they've done is they've given us the five major entry jobs into cyber. Uh, so starting with, with analysts and going all the way through to uh, network people, um, and obviously having pen testers in there. The analysts and the pen testers by far the most popular. Um, and then we use the, uh, the Digital Cyber Academy from Immersive Labs in Bristol, um, sort of for, for people who are at a, you already have a degree in, in IT computer science or maybe you know, have done some cyber options. And then the, all the guys who've done the NCI and the Letter Kenny programs, uh, and the guys who are now from MTU have done, done a lot of work. So we have that as an advanced program for them. Um, and what's interesting is the, the Immersive Labs approach is completely different from the uh, InfoSec programs. InfoSec is very structured, you know, lots of e-learning, lots of video-based stuff, where Immersive Labs, I think, is, is more true to reality in that it's largely about laboratories that help you to problem solve. Um, and for me, one of the key skills, key competencies, I think, in cyber is an ability to, to solve problems. But what's interesting is, you know, what we've learned, I think, is, you know, both approaches work, but it's like everything else, different courses mm -hmm. for different courses to some extent. Um, and, and the big issue and one of the concerns that I have about education for cybersecurity, uh, just ignoring the universities and colleges for a minute, because that's, that's a bigger discussion. Um, but there is an obsession in terms of qualifications. You know, uh, now the InfoSec material that we use does assessments that lend themselves towards things like CompTIA, um, which is grand. But a lot of the guys that we see coming through our hands, I mean, that's, that's all they're interested in is getting more and more qualifications. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's okay, but that doesn't actually prove a whole lot when you go out into the big bad world of job hunting. Um, but there is an obsession, particularly with the younger guys, you know, that they have to have all sorts of qualifications. And the reality is once you join a good company, you know, they're, they're, they're gonna immerse you in their training and really help you move, drive in exactly the right direction. So there is something about, you know, we've oversold, I think the qualifications you know, to the detriment of the skills development. And I think 
you know, for me, one, one of the big lessons that we've learned in the whole thing is play the qualifications down, but like really get the people stuck into skills. Uh, and that will help enormously. Yeah, interesting, because I, I suppose I see a lot, and it, it always amuses me when I, you know, when I see um, a client probably looking for a, a kind of a, a mid or junior level um, security person, and they're looking for somebody with a CISSP uh, certification, and, you know, uh, yeah. very rarely anybody will have this. Um, Daryl, what, what are your thoughts on, on um, certifications, and, and where are you with that? I completely agree. Sorry, this is Daryl. Daryl, sorry. You're confusing each other. Sorry, uh, Daryl, yeah. Oh, sorry, it was me. Apologies. Uh, yeah, um, look, it depends what uh, area of security you're in, um, as some of the panelists have mentioned before. Um, I think, you know, the security industry, I think, is like two, two pain points for me, which is overselling of courses and overselling of tools. Um, you know, and then as Colin has mentioned there, just some of the good old fashioned skills, you know, getting in the door, uh, you know, understanding the basic principles and then just doing some of the boring heavy lifting, you know, whether that's maybe we're certifying user access it's, in a lot of companies, maybe it's not automated, it's manual, it's not much fun. It's a good starting point, makes you appreciate, you know, the basics around access and things like that. So, um, yeah, I do think, um, you know, I, I don't want to go and name any qualifications, even some I have myself. Like when you once you sit the exam, I don't know what it tells you. Um, you know, it's not. Um, yeah, I, I I think they're definitely overrated. Um, I do think if somebody has them, it shows you know uh, a commitment to the industry, a willingness to learn. A lot of them aren't that easy to get, so that that definitely says something about a candidate's uh, willingness. But um, the ability to apply something like those certifications. Um, maybe soft skills like communication skills, uh, as we call it, call them my 100% uh, degree problem solving is the number one skill um, to have an information security. But if somebody was a good communicator, could solve problems, I would take that every day over, you know, a plethora of, um, you know, uh, accreditations that you have to maintain, you have to pay money for, and you have to answer 300 questions in three hours, and they all sound like the same question, and you're pretty sure you're being tricked. Um, like I, I do, I do question um, the value of uh, some of these certifications. And you're you're bang on, Ian. Uh, some job specs look like somebody's mashed the keyboard. There's so many acronyms uh, that they're looking for. But yeah, I think I, if I was to speak to anybody, I'd say, look, if you're going on the technical side, yeah, you know, it'd be it'd be something like the CISP would be very strong uh, to have. But you know, one or two. I wouldn't be going pouring my life into studying them. I'd be working harder in the job, asking for more work, get involved in more projects. Because when you're interviewing, I'm going to say, you know, have you done this? Not do you have this certification? And, you know, how do you apply your security knowledge? Not what security certs you have. So that would be my two cents. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Dara, do you want to jump in? And Dara? Yeah, 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 of course. So I completely agree with what the panelists have just said. Um, my own kind of thoughts and advice would be, there's a lot of certifications out there and I, I don't want to name them and stuff like that, but coming back to a real point, um, a problem that I've seen is with some of the certifications, and particularly around tooling, and particularly where people are attaining certifications for very specific tools, it kind of does abstract them a bit from the problem solving aspect of security where an engineer may become more of a run the tool administrator versus an absolute security engineer. And the goal should be to be that problem solver. So I would, I would, I would agree with what the panelists are saying. And when it comes to certifications, you know, it really makes sure that it aligns with where you want to be in, in your future kind of growth pro progression path. Right, yeah. And Stefania, um, obviously with, and I'm, you correct me if I'm wrong, when it comes to kind of more the governance and compliance side of things, are certifications something that you, you kind of really need to have? I think from from my perspective uh, and what I see out there is when it comes to these type of roles that they seem to be a lot more uh, of a must have than, than uh, you know, an advantage. Yeah, so uh, depends, I suppose, also on the sector uh, you are working on. Um, let's say if you're working in a highly regulated sector, um, it could be uh, an advantage to have a certification. 
which somehow uh, kind of demonstrate um, a supervisor, for instance, to uh, the, the knowledge and skills of, of the employees within the organization. Having said that, um, of course, experience and um, is key probably, you know, to, to, to enter in an organization, but that does depend on the, on the job role you are applying for. Um, so I would say both of them uh, can be useful, you know, have a lot of experience, but also have some certification. It mainly demonstrate that the, the, the person is willing to continue to study and continue to learn. So it shows a little bit uh, of the personality and the, the willingness of, of the person. And can I just add one other thing to that? Um, one of the things that we're seeing, and I'm going to be ages here, but particularly with the younger guys, a lot of whom would be grads, you know, um, is that, and, and I, I don't, know, don't know what they're doing at third level, um, particularly in, in relation to some, some of these uh, computer science IT degrees. But what we're seeing is a real need, like this is jumping out of us virtually every week, a real need for improved communication skills. And I know that's, that covers a multitude of things, but if you want your people to work in teams, and you want them to solve problems, and you want them, you know, to be, you know, part of the organization. Then simple things like understand, you know, how, how we communicate these days, and I mean, you know, using all sorts of systems like Teams, email, you know, whatever you fancy. Um, but but the whole area, I think, one of the things that just doesn't seem to be there is that just that um, you could call it business etiquette. It's a term we've been using loosely over the last week. But understanding that if you're working on an organization, you're supposed to be organized, you know. Uh, that's that's part of the gig, but there's there seems to be a lack of understanding of the necessity just to be able to relay your message and respond to messages that have been sent to you. Now, for me in, in the cyber world in particular, that just seems so critical. But but a lot of the guys that we're meeting on the under twenty fives in particular don't seem to get that. You know, now we have a very diverse group of people. We're, we now have twenty three different nationalities on the program. But this isn't just necessarily, you know, one nationality. This is everybody of a certain age group. So there's a there's a real need. I think I know something that we're going to have to bring in this the cyber quest like really seriously. Um, but there's a real necessity. I think you know when you bring new younger people into the organisation that you give them a heavy heavy dose of good old fashioned communication skills. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Re really good point there, uh, Colin. Um, so my last question, I suppose this will be for pretty much everybody. So I'm keen to get everybody's perspective. Um, I think we, we, we jump in, we start with Stefania, ladies first. Um, so looking into kind of uh, next year, uh, obviously there's been a lot of challenges this year and I'm sure next year is gonna present even more challenges uh, for the industry. Um, what do you see being the kind of main challenges uh, presenting themselves going into next year? Yeah, so I suppose overall in terms of cybersecurity and cyber attacks, we can just expect an, a continuously increase of uh, cyber attacks. And um, if we think about artificial intelligence, which is um, more and more uh, being used, will indeed improve um, cybersecurity controls, but at the same time, will also uh, it will also be used by attackers uh, which will have, uh, which we will probably have more sophisticated attacks. Uh, so that's something that has to be taken into consideration, as well as the use of uh, cryptocurrency, uh, which has been seen as um, an, a method of receiving um, uh, credit money from extortions of malware, um, and that again uh, is something that is just going to increase. And another aspect to take into consideration is um, digitalization. Many organizations now have uh, digital transformation programs, which means that more and more data will be available on the internet and more and more data will be exposed. And, and then if we think about the use of third parties, four parties, cloud computing by uh, organization that nowadays very often you know, go externally for IT services, 
but uh, if something goes outside of the organization is of course could be more difficult to control um, and that that expose organization to to some probably new risks very good um i don't know uh, dara do you want to jump in um with the same question is that dara or daryl dara <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so perfect. So I I'd, um, I'd agree with what Stefan said. Um, I still think that um, we still need to be very um, adaptive and very fluid to not just the threat landscape, but the technical landscape. So some of the things that Stefan just pointed out in terms of a lot of companies may go to the cloud. Right? Cloud versus on-prem is a much larger discussion for the scope of this call. But kind of really align your, your, your security posture to to where you know where your, your your assets, your data, your resources live, and to be able to you know be able to be fluid in that regard because things do change pretty quickly. So I think the challenge over the next two years will be adapting to that, and also the fallout from COVID. Like an hour before this call, like I got a scam call myself. You know, it's just also getting back to some of the basics, um, end user awareness and stuff like that, and being able to circulate the message of IT security through through or, through or organizations to give visibility to some of these type of scams that we're seeing um, and that we are getting that information out effectively out to our user base or, you know, or whatever we're protecting. Very good. Good stuff. Thanks for that, Dara. And Daryl, do you want to um, jump in? Hey, yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, I suppose so a challenge in 2022, I think the big thing that's changed uh, often, you know, you see these come out every year and little changes. The same problems exist and the same solutions are, are always there. But I think what's changed in the last year or so is obviously been COVID, so remote working. So I think, um, and this isn't just purely security, but I think it's all industries, the retention of staff. And, um, you know, if you want the best, um, a lot of people have left major cities, whether that's like Dublin or London or whatever. So, you know, the, the flexibility to be able to allow people to work in different uh, locations now you might think well is that a security threat you know that's a different point but what I would say is if you're struggling to retain security staff if you're wanting to attract the best security staff I think and maybe it's true for finance and other areas of any organization but the more flexible you are uh, the more likely you are to maybe attract um, and retain uh, more people and then um, maybe maybe just the last point and kind of ties into that whole retention of staff piece Anybody running a security program, whether you're a CISO or a head of security or whatever it might be, um, you never have enough staff, you never have enough um, you know, budget uh, approved, um, and there's just never enough hands to do all the work. And once you fix one thing, you know, you realize you have a bigger problem. So I think um, another, I don't know, is it, that challenge is still there, but I think the more businesses can approach like, scalability of their security services so when you're designing solutions whether say user access or information security awareness or whatever it might be that you think about um automation and how you can introduce that and um, one you know you're going to lose your staff if you have them maybe doing menial work uh, and then equally too you can't keep on putting the hand out to your cto or your um, you know your cfo uh, saying you constantly need more resource or trying to constantly, um, you know, ask when, you know, the smart thing, and I think a lot of organizations, and certainly is the case of Revolut, you know, scalability of your service and uh, automation. I think companies really need to double down on that. Yeah, interesting point. And, and I suppose from, from my perspective as well, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of companies looking for that kind of DevOps slash security person, somebody's going to come in, identify uh, these mundane tasks and automate them and automate as much as possible, uh, especially within larger organizations uh, to, so they can attract these people in uh, so they're, they're not uh, doing these. And maybe, and maybe just add to that point as well, I think, I think uh, maybe something, and maybe it's not true for every industry, but I think more security teams need uh, developers you know, to aid the likes of that uh, automation and development. Um, I think AppSec and, uh, you know, security engineers, you, you, you can speak more accurately in, but they're thin on the ground or they're hard to get, and, and certainly the better ones are hard to retain. 
Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think security teams uh, need to be uh, drawn on developers uh, to, aid, to aid those points that are made. Interesting, interesting. Good stuff. Um, I think, is that everybody answered that question or? I, I just, I have. Yeah, one, one thing that I think it's absolute necessity now, and they're, all, they're always slow to start, but I think the HR people, you know, really need to be brought on board on this, on this mission. Um, and I think what we often see is we, you know, when you look at some of the, the stuff that you would see in, in terms of job specs, yeah. you know, like it's, it's their wish lists in, instead of job specifications. And, yeah. and the issue I think a lot of the time is that, you know, the HR guys, and I am one, you know, they're, they're often slow, you know, to come into the game, you know, but if ever there was a time for them to, to come into this cyber game that's right now, I think there's just an absolute necessity and whether it's on the part of the engineers and the engineer and managers to help them, I'm not too sure. But you know what I see is they, they need to be brought on board because if, particularly with their learning colleagues, you know the, the key to success here is that there's a continuous learning activity going on in every organization because the bad guys are getting better. You know, therefore, you know, you really need to be trying to keep up the speed in relation to them. And I think just at a, at a sort of for me, one of the big lessons out of the HSE was just the fact that we don't have, you know, a cyber security strategy in Ireland. Uh, and we really, you know, when you see the public sector falling apart, you know, literally, you know, because of a ransomware attack, then it just indicates clearly that we're not too sure as to how we should deal with this. And if you have a look at, you know, places like Singapore, you know, who've done a pretty good job in terms of an overall strategy and policy across other government departments, they're, they're doing the right stuff. So, so, I, so I, I would be really keen, you know, continue the learning process, but let's try and bring that across the entire public sector, because we know that in the private sector, you know, the inclination is always to take these things seriously, but in, in the public sector, it looks like a, sometimes like a huge demanding place upon them, but the reality is, if we don't get this right, then all these notional things that the IDA have about Ireland being a security hub, you know, just, it's just pan in the sky stuff, you know. So, you know, there needs to be a seriousness attached to all of this at a national level uh, to try and ensure that we can continue to develop as a country. Interesting, yeah. And on the job spec uh, front as well, from my perspective, uh, for me, I think it's important to speak to, <clears throat> you know, a hiring manager or, or a head of the department to, to really find out kind of what they're looking to achieve in terms of the security. And I think that's kind of how you then find the right person for what they're looking for because a lot of the job specs you're right they're, they're very generic and and you know a security engineer for one organization could be completely different to a security engineer in another organization so it's really trying to find out what they're looking to achieve overall in terms of their security uh, and then for me to 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 go out and, and find the right skill set so um, yeah it's, it's a really good point there good stuff well look that that's uh, been really interesting really great insights there um <clears throat> we're going to go to a couple of questions that have come in um so uh, uh they haven't asked who to uh, answer so i'll just i'll just read it out um so the question is is there any way that uh, the mobile phone companies should uh, be able to to block the scam callers <clears throat> and uh, and why is it that in the us that uh, the the us mobile usa mobile phone companies uh, are able to block the calls from being sent out i don't know if anybody wants to jump in and take that I can attempt it. So I did work in the US quite a bit and when I was working in GameStop. And what I would say is that there would be some restrictions um, within Europe about you know, the GDPR and data regulation um, that may prohibit or may kind of hamstring some of the providers to be able to do the automatic kind of blocking. But I do I have seen in the industry this is something that they are trying to address. Yeah, good stuff. Um, one more question actually has come in. Um, what is the best way to protect company emails? Uh, we get a lot of spam emails into our uh, office emails. Does anybody want to jump on that? I think that's just going to be a suitable uh, tooling um, to you know filter that out. I'm not going to start naming uh, brands or whatever now, but it just depends. You know, um, 
you know, are, are you in the cloud? Um, do somebody like AWS or whoever offer a service? Um, do you need to use an external vendor? So if you're asking that question, you probably need to, uh, you know, whatever, do a bit of research or actually hire the appropriate people because that just be a fundamental of whatever IT management. Um, but yeah, uh, just various products out there um, that would enable you to do that. So thanks for that, um, Darren. Appreciate it. So um, that's it. That's um, all the questions asked. Really appreciate all your time, guys. We finished up a little bit early. Um, so I don't, if there's anything else you guys want to add, um, but uh, or if there's any other questions coming in, I don't think there is. Um, you can throw them in now. But uh, uh, look, it's been it's been uh, really uh, insightful. Uh, thanks for everybody for their for their insights. Um, and, and, and joining, taking their time off to, to join the events. Thank you. I'll be keen to get the feedback soon uh, and uh, catch up with you guys uh, down the line as well, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.